I wanted just to start off at the heart, and I knew there was no one better to get us to the heart than Ida Benedetto. <laughs> I wanted to start out with a little activity so we can get to know each other better because we're going to be spending the next two days with each other. So if, um, if your home base, your home that you traveled from to be here today is 10 blocks away or further, I want you to stand up. Look around. All right, so that's the vast majority of people in the room. Now stay standing if you traveled from outside of the Bay Area to be here. If you came from outside the Bay Area to be here, stay standing. So if you're from the Bay Area, you can have a seat now. Look around, wow, okay, so most people came from outside of this area, cool. If you came from outside the state of California, stay standing. <laughs> Starting to whittle it down. And if you came from outside of the United States to be here, stay standing. So these people who are standing, they're offering us something really important through the course of the summit. They're coming from other cultures outside of the United States, and so they're gonna really challenge our assumptions about what works in terms of immersive design. So I want, to look to, to, I want you all to look to them to make sure that your assumptions are bulletproof in terms of human nature and how people respond to experiences. Okay, everybody can sit down. We're gonna do a few more rounds of this. I know you're all cold, right? At least we should move around a little bit to get started. I'm cold at least. Um, if you consider yourself an artist, stand up. Look around at all the artists in the room. Lots of artists in the room. Great, okay. If you consider yourself a designer, stand up. That means if you're an artist and not a designer, sit down. Lots of people consider themselves both artists and designers. Clearly there's a lot of bleed between those categories. Um, if you consider yourself a producer, stand up. Clearly, we're all doing too many things. <laughs> it's like everybody's just doing everything. If you're a scientist, stand up. These are the scientists in the room. Again, clearly a rare breed, so like, let's look to them to bring some variety and diversity of thinking. Um, if you consider yourself something else, if the category of artist, designer, producer, scientist does not apply to you at all, stand up. If you couldn't stand for any of the previous categories, I want you to stand up. Are you standing right here in the front row? Are you standing to something else? Yeah, I'm like trying to figure out what artist includes. <laughs> okay, so we have, what's your name? My name is Chantine. Chantine? Tantine doesn't know what artists include, so she's standing. Um, Kent, I think you stood up for scientist. Yeah, but I'm, I'm more of a philosopher. Okay, so Kent. <laughs> All right, Kent is the philosopher. Maybe you can help the help this woman here figure out what she is. I'm gonna take one more. What do you consider yourself? What's your name? Uh, Eric. And what are you? Um, so I'm a co-founder of a company called Prismagic, sort of on the business side. I don't care about that part. I'm on the business side. Business. Business. You're a businessman. Great. Cool. Um, so I was going to say that there's like a diversity of skill sets that go into this, but clearly we're wearing all the hats, so maybe that's not relevant. We're jacks of all trades. Thank you. Everyone can sit down now. We're going to do one final round of this. Um, and I, I like, you know, don't push this one. Like, only if you really feel it, I want you to stand up. If you... Consider yourself doing your dream job. <laughs> Lots of people here are doing their dream job. That's excellent. Okay. If you have no idea what is next in your career, <laughs> we're, we're, we've got 
two days together, now's the time to be honest about this because there's probably people who can help you out in the room. Stand up. Lots of people also have no idea what's next in their career. Okay, great. Um, now, I want you to stand if both of those statements are true. If you are doing your dream job right now and you have no idea what is next in your career. Also, also a, a good number of people, look around, notice who's still standing. These people, they're the unconscious innovators among us. Because since they love what they are doing, they're fully in the present. And since they don't know what's next, they can follow the potential of what they are doing wherever it needs to go. And so that's a very special role that these people are playing for the community here today. Thank you. That's the end of the stand up, sit down portion. <laughs> Um, this is an activity that I learned from a woman named Priya Parker. She wrote a book called The Art of Gathering, and I'm honored to be among the 100 people uh, she interviewed to write the book. And she comes a from a conflict resolution background. She specializes in the art of bringing people who are at odds with each other together and helping them find common ground and understanding. She interviewed me um, because of work I did um, through Sextant Works, which was a creative practice I co-founded with Andy Austin in New York in 2012. Uh, we created experiences in places you aren't supposed to be. And this happened, this came about very organically. We literally stumbled upon an abandoned honeymoon resort in the Poconos of Pennsylvania, and we're so captivated by the place that we wanted to create an experience there, an adventure. Um, and it went so well that we kept it up. We did a photo scavenger hunt of the Domino Sugar Refinery in Brooklyn. Uh, we would do annual infiltrations of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And perhaps most famously, we created the Night Heron Speakeasy, which was an illegal drinking establishment in a dry water tower in Chelsea in Manhattan. Now, in kind of interrogating our work and looking at what the core qualities of the work was, we identified four core qualities. And they were generosity, location, intimacy, and transgression. In the case of the Night Heron, uh, the location is obviously very special. The intimacy is there because you're in these tight confines with people. As is the transgression, because we were really trespassing, we had absolutely no permission to be using this location. But the thing that really pushed the experience over the edge was the element of generosity. These were the pocket watches that were used as admission system into the Night Heron, and you could only come as a gift from somebody who had already been. So we were creating these adventures, and it became apparent to me that we were really doing something right that we were probably taking for granted. People consistently went further and were more wowed by what they went through than even we had anticipated. So I decided to take a step back and interrogate what really makes a social experience truly transformative. And to do this, um, I selected a series of case studies. I decided to look at sex parties, funerals, and wilderness trips. <laughs> so these might seem like very different kinds of experiences, but I actually saw some really important commonalities in them. They all involve some element of risk, real risk, be that social, emotional, or physical. They require active participation to happen. They're fundamentally social and interpersonal. When they're at their best, they have transformative potential for the people involved. And they are what I like to call inexhaustible. And this is a term I, I borrowed from translations of Buddhist texts. The dharmas are inexhaustible, suffering is inexhaustible. And so these experiences too, they are inexhaustible in that what any individual goes through in them is so vast and varied that nobody else, not even the designer, can fully comprehend or anticipate them. So in looking at these different kinds of experiences, I actually broke down the different component parts of them and the kind of highest level decisions that a designer might make in creating a transformative experience of this regard. I came up with four broad categories that show up across all of them. The risk, the magic circle, the structure of the experience, and then also the nature of the transformation. 
you can read about this in detail online. It's all up available at patternsoftransformation.com. Um, I know several, more than several of you in the room have really delved into this already, and I thank all of you for giving it your time and attention and sharing how it might have influenced your work already. But in doing this, the realization that I came to is that transformation requires risk. And that it is through creating the supportive structure of an experience that you allow people to approach something that without that support would be too dangerous for them to get close to otherwise. And it is through that proximity to real risk, risk that is bigger than the designer themselves, that something can change for the better in all of the participants. Uh, in talking to Noah about my work and preparing for this talk, he brought up this excellent term from programming called writing down to the metal. Um, and this is when um, you're writing code that is not operating on the operating system level or uh, interacting with other software in the system. It's actually engaging with the physicality of the machine of the computer itself. And so there's something about certain kinds of experience design and immersive design that we can actually end up writing down to the metal of the human experience. So I started out doing urban trespassing with Sextant Works. I then went on to look at the design of transformative social experiences in writing patterns of transformation. And in doing this work and getting really close to what it takes to write to the metal of the human experience, I seem to have fallen through a trap door that I was not looking for. And I've decided to call this my phase of doing spiritual trespassing. Um, I have, a, I have a day job, an excellent day job at a company called SY Partners. We are a management consultancy and we uh, work with leadership teams at very high impact organizations to help them reconnect with the organization's purpose and transform so that organization can more fully live the purpose out in the world. This is a picture of an exercise I helped design where the leadership team was so threatened by the changes their organization was going through that they started to turn on each other because they were operating from fear. So we had to create an experience where they would confront their own problematic behaviors and the roots of their fear so that they could work together better. So this is what I'm doing uh, in my day job, and that allows me you know, nights and weekends to do a lot of spiritual trespassing. Um, this shows up in the form of exploring subtle energies through Reiki and Tantra, um, astrological studies, shamanic work, and ayahuasca journey, journeys. And this work still has that quality of trespassing a little bit that I encountered with doing sextant works because these practices and the places that you can go because of them are not things that society as a whole still embraces regularly. The places I end up, they feel a little bit neglected and underloved. So the spiritual trespassing, it's like I was starting to write to the metal and then got past the metal to whatever's like after the metal. Um, and I invite you to take this potential uh, in your work seriously, um, because we're, we're all kind of playing with that a little bit in terms of embodied experiences. Um, take it seriously, but in the most playful and adventurous way, because I think that we can use our art form of immersive design to really address the core needs of society. The need to understand ourselves, the need to uh, find meaning in chaos, and the need to connect with each other. This is gonna get both easier and harder as immersive design comes to the fore. The audiences are increasingly there. The funding is increasingly there. So the opportunities to make work are increasing, but the temptation to give people what they want is also increasing, instead of actually creating what we need. In the spiritual trespassing work, um, I have found that there are basically three ways to access uh, hidden or taboo knowledge, aside from dreaming and having sex. Um, and those involve looking at the stars, eating trippy plants, and listening to percussive sound. Uh, I have been learning from folks like Chani Nicholas, who is an astrologer who's working primarily with ancient astrological techniques, not modern psychological stuff so much. And um, she has found that that is an incredibly fertile bedrock to grow a very queer radical politic and get that into the um, popular consciousness. 
I've also been looking closely at the work of Jeff Jeffrey Cripple, who I know there's some fans of Jeffrey here in the audience today. And he's looking at very extreme religious experiences and how they manifest or are produced through the body. And that the interesting thing about these kinds of experiences is because they operate on the body, they travel very easily from one culture to another because they're operating on the same psychosomatic base. One of my professional idols is Zenith Virago, who uh, she's a mortician fundamentally, working out of Australia. And for a long time in her community, she endeavored to, meet, to be the most expensive wedding efficient around so that she could counsel the dying and the mourning on any terms that they needed. I've also been learning a lot from the renowned shamanic teacher, Sandra Ingerman. Um, again, using percussive sound to go into a light trance state to access wisdom and knowledge. So I would like um, to start out the summit by inviting you all to do a little bit of spiritual trespassing with me. Um, we're going to try out doing a shamanic journey together. And so you all have conscious reasons for being here, reasons you've decided to come to the summit that are you know, overt. Um, but there might be unconscious reasons or hidden opportunities waiting for you here. And shamanic journeying is a very accessible method for accessing that wisdom. The term shamanism is from Siberia originally, but these techniques show up across cultures broadly, again, because it's operating on the body, it's operating on our psychosomatic base of using percussive sound to go into a light trance state. This is so close to our operating system as human beings that it ends up showing up, like I said, in many, many different cultures. Um, if the idea of traveling to the spirit realm is challenging for you, which is totally fine, it's challenging for many people, even me sometimes, um, you can think of this as simply connecting with your subconscious. Um, it can often feel, like me at least, it can feel like lucid dreaming. Um, it might feel a little bit different for you, but whatever you feel or whatever you experience is the right thing. Um, I have never tried this with a group this big. So this is a bit of an experiment. Um, this is me taking a risk with you all. It's also me being pretty vulnerable because this is a practice that I literally trapped or stumbled into by accident, not really trying, and have derived a lot of um, joy and insight from over the past year. So this is also me being very vulnerable with you all by sharing this. And so I would ask you to, to match my risk and match my vulnerability by giving it a try together. And again, whatever you experience is the right thing. It's OK if this isn't working for you. It gets a little weird. Anything you go through is the right thing. So the way we're going to start is I'm going to ask you to find a partner, somebody sitting conveniently next to you. This might be easier if you pick somebody you don't know that well. Sometimes it's easier to kind of divulge to a stranger because the social consequences of opening up are lower. <laughs> for being here. I'm going to give you two minutes to share your overt reasons or intentions for being here at the summit. What got you here? Why are you here? Sharing, raise your hand. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so now you've, you've found a partner, you've shared your overt reasons for being here. Um, now, what we're going to do um, is I'm going to rattle. Um, and I am going to lead you through the process of um, going to, again, spirit world or subconscious, however you want it, whatever frameworks for you. And discover what might be some other reasons for you to be here. Uh, this is my rattle. My first teacher gave it to me. Um, so you're going to do this with your eyes closed. I'll talk through it. And then as I rattle, I will also talk. 
um, but let me kind of give you the, the basic background first. Um, so you're going to set your intention, and what you're going to do, the first thing you have to do when you're doing shamanic journey is you have to connect with a guide. It's not a good idea to kind of wander around spirit realm without <laughs> a local guide. And so what you're going to do is you're going to look for a power animal, which I think should seem very familiar from like Harry Potter and all of that stuff. Um, so again, whatever frame of reference works for you. Um, you're going to set the intention to connect with a helping and compassionate power animal. Uh, you're going to close your eyes and get comfortable. And I ask during this, if it, again, if it's working for you, great. If it's not working, just stay still just so you don't disrupt the experience of the people around you. It's a very, very light trance state. It's really easy to disturb people as they're in it. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to imagine yourself in nature, in a place in nature, a real place that you feel really connected to. It could be some place from childhood. It could be some place from a vacation, whatever it is. Bring it to mind really vividly. Um, and when you're there, you're going to imagine yourself traveling down, down below the earth. So that could be through a body of water. It could th be through an actual hole. It could, and I see some people closing their eyes. I'm going to rattle to do this. It'll be more vibrant when I'm rattling. Uh, thank you for jumping right in. Um, you're gonna, or like a, a root of a tree or something like that. You're just going to go down. Imagine yourself going down. And you will end up in another layer of nature. It could be any kind of landscape. And when you get there, you're going to look around. You're going to wander around see what's there, and an animal should present it to you. If you went in with the intention of finding an animal and you ask it, are you my power animal? And if it says yes, then ask it, what, what am I here to do? What am I here at the Immersive Design Summit to do? And it can communicate with you in any fashion it likes and listen. If you ask the power animal, are you my power animal, and it does not respond in the affirmative, keep looking. This is what happened to me the first time I encountered something and they're like, nope, and I'm like, okay, gonna keep going. That might happen to you also. Um, I'm going to rattle, I'm going to repeat these instructions as I'm rattling so you can follow my instructions as we go. Um, and I'm going to rattle for about five minutes, um, which again, because this can feel like dreaming is actually, a, should be a pretty long time. And again, anything you experience is the right thing. Some of you in the audience I know already know what your power animal is. If that is the case, stick with that power animal. Don't go find another one. Just go, go check in with your power animal and ask what you're here at the Immersive Design Summit to do. This is the regular rattling. How's that sound? Is that loud enough? Yeah. Um, when we're finished, I will do a return rattle, which is this. More of that swirling. When that happens, what you're going to do is you're going to thank your power animal, and you're going to retrace your steps. However you got down, you're going to retrace your steps to go back up and come back into the room and open your eyes. Um, I'm so, everybody's sitting here eagerly listening. I'm so grateful for everybody to give this a go. I'm getting the five minute mark too. Um, so, so we're going to jump in. <laughs> so get comfortable, close your eyes. You could even, if you have a scarf, you could toss it over your eyes. If it's easier, if it's darker. Um, yeah, settle in. So again, set the intention to connect with a helping, compassionate power animal. And place yourself in a place in nature that you really love. Bring it to mind vividly. And find a way to go down below the ground. Travel down, down, let yourself sink into the earth. And when you get to a new spot, where it opens back up into new terrain, look around, explore, and see what animal or animals might come to you. Whatever creature you encounter, ask it if it is your power animal. And if it is, ask it what you are here at the Immersive Design Summit to do.
and you can feel free to ask your power animal any other questions you might have as well. We're going to start to wrap up. Thank whoever or whatever you encountered. Thank them for whatever they communicated to you. And however you got to wherever you are, retrace your steps. Go back up. wherever you started in a place in nature and come back into the room. When you're back, open your eyes. And now I want you to Turn back to your partner. We'll feel the space that you're in. Might feel a little bit different. Might feel the same. Might feel a little bit different than when you went in. And turn to your partner and just share what came up, what, what you discovered about why you're here. And again, anything that happened to you is the right thing. Um, even if you just closed your eyes and didn't see anything, just that moment of reflection might have brought something up for you. So turn back to your partner and, and share. adventures in immersive design and experience design are going off into spiritual trespassing, but I want to ask you all, what do we as a culture and individuals and society really need right now? And how is it that our immersive arts can be in service of that, whatever forms of adventures and trespassing you might be up to, but see how close you can get to that act of writing to the metal of the human experience. Thank you for trying that experiment with me. I look forward to hearing from you individually on how it went. Yeah.